Welcome back to English 112. This is for our class for Tuesday, the 19th of April, where we are talking about a raisin in the sun. And you'll see in the notes below, I have some due dates listed. That journal number two, which will be on drama, where I'm asking you to respond briefly, approximately a page or so, for each of the major dramas that we've read this semester. So a page or so for Oedipus, a page or so for Midsummer, and then finally a page or so for Raisin in the Sun. And that will be due on the 21st via PDF to my email, ruiz at gcc.mass.edu similar to what you did with the first journal and i will evaluate for content not for grammar or mechanics and put a check mark grade on it and then return that back to you and hopefully that'll help inform some of your writing for your second paper which is going to be on drama and that will be due on the 5th of may via pdf to again my email ruiz at gcc.mass.edu very similar to what you did with the first paper approximately four to five pages a critical paper so you are analyzing the text itself um, whether it be that you decide to write about oedipus the king or midsummer night's dream or ultimately a raisin in the sun and journal number three, because soon we will be transitioning from drama to poetry, will be due at 11.59 p.m. And that will be on the 10th of May, um, Tuesday, um, via PDF to Ruiz, R-U-I-Z, at gcc.mass.edu. Again, we won't have time to write a paper number three, but I will have time to return your journal to you so that you could utilize that journal for our final exam, since the bulk of the final will be devoted to poetry, since there won't be a paper devoted to poetry. In the final exam, 80 points will be devoted to poetry. What I'm going to be doing is selecting a handful of the poems that we talked about in the poetry section. And I am going to ask you to choose two of those and to analyze those poems. And if we were meeting in person, you would do this either on May 12th at 1 p.m. or Tuesday, May 17th at 10.30 a.m. Those are the two times for my two in-person classes. So that said, you are obviously taking the final examination online, and I'm going to ask you to choose which date you would like me to pose post the final exam, either Thursday, May 12th at 1 or Tuesday, May 17th at 10.30. You would have 24 hours to respond to that particular final exam. Uh, for my in-person classes, they have two hours, though if they need a little bit more time, I would be granting them that time. So basically, I don't expect you to spend 24 hours working on the final. I would expect you to spend anywhere between two, no more than three hours on the final examination. And while the bulk of it is devoted to poetry, there will be a 10-point question on short story. I'll give you two options, ask you to choose one. And a 10-point question on drama. Again, two options, I ask you to choose one, just to basically give a overview of the semester as a whole. So in terms of looking at the syllabus, I was thinking that on the 28th, which is Thursday, could leave that as an open class to work on paper number two, drama. So at this point, um, again, I'm thinking about it as a kind of writing workshop and an opportunity also for you to ask questions if you wanted to. You could contact me or you can always send me a draft and I can give you feedback as well. And we will adjust the course syllabus accordingly so that we've got that class um, for you to be able to work on your paper before you submit it. So we've been talking about a raisin in the sun. And I wanted to specifically talk about some quotation because Lorraine Hansberry is a wonderful writer, not just a wonderful storyteller, right down to her stage directions. And of course, if we were watching a performance, we wouldn't be reading the stage directions, but I wanted to draw your attention to the stage directions. This would be on page 23 of the text that I had ordered for class, because I think the stage directions are just as literary as anything else within the drama. And we're told in Act 1, Scene 1, the younger living room would be a comfortable and well-ordered room, if not for a number of indestructible contradictions to the state of being. 
let me just stop here and say, is not the idea of indestructible contradiction a major theme within this particular drama? And then I'll continue on. Its furnishings are typical and undistinguished, and their primary feature now is that they've clearly had to accommodate the living of too many people for too many years, and they are tired. Let me stop here and say, notice how she is personifying the furniture, giving human qualities to inanimate objects, that the furniture is tired to illustrate how tired the family is as well. And I'll continue on. Still, we can see that at some time, a time probably no longer remembered by the family, except perhaps for Mama, the furnishings of this room were actually selected with care and love and even hope and brought to this apartment and arranged with taste and pride. The idea of hope, and we had talked about this in terms of the title, A Raisin in the Sun, based on the poem Harlem and what happens to a dream deferred. The idea if a dream becomes deferred too long, then one loses hope. And that's one of the struggles that we see within this particular drama. Page 26, again, a very minor detail, but this is at the beginning of the play where Walter and Ruth are getting ready for breakfast. And Ruth asks Walter, how does he want his eggs? He says, not scrambled. And then she scrambles them. So this is important, I think, on a number of levels. It certainly shows the tension within the relationship, some passive aggressive behavior here. You know, one might also argue that their lives are scrambled and that Walter's thinking as well is scrambled. There's a good amount of sexism in this play and certainly we see that illustrated with Walter. It is one of the reasons why Walter is not necessarily an attractive character. But that said, none of the characters are blameless. All of them have flaws, which I think gives a sense of realism to the play that we don't necessarily see in some of the earlier plays that we read throughout the semester. There, there's definitely a sense of realism here. And one of the sexist things that Walter happens to say is, and this is to his own sister, Benita, who wants to be a doctor, which would be quite the aspiration during this time period, considering the fact that she's a woman, considering the fact that she's poor, and considering the fact that she's black. And he says, who the hell told you you had to be a doctor? You so crazy about messing around with sick people? Then go be a nurse like other woman, women, or just get married and be quiet. Now, one of the things that was not illustrated, actually there were several scenes that were not illustrated in the Sidney Poitier version of the film, or of the drama. Um, usually because of time, there are sections that are deleted. But there's one section about rats that I think shows how dire the situation is for the family. This is when Benita and Ruth are speaking with one another. And this is where Benita is saying, well, we don't have room for another human being. The idea that Ruth is now pregnant. Where is he going to sleep? On the roof? And then what happens? There's a sudden commotion. For me, this is on page 58. On the street, Benita goes to the window to look out. What on earth is going on out there? These kids. There are, she throws open the window, the shouts of children rising up from the street. She sticks her head out to see better and calls out, Travis, Travis, what are you doing down there? And she sees, oh Lord, they're chasing a rat. Ruth covers her face with her hands and turns away. And Mama angrily says, tell that youngin to get himself up here at once. And Benita says, Travis, you come upstairs at once. And Ruth, her face twisted, chasing a rat. And Mama looking at Ruth, worried, and asking about the doctor. And then Travis comes in, excited and full of narrative. So for me, this is on page 59. Mama, you should have seen the rat, big as a cat, honest. He shows an exaggerated size with his hands. Golly, the rat was really cutting and Bubber caught him with his heel. And the janitor, Mr. Barnett, got him with a stick. And then they got him in a corner and bam, bam, bam. And he was still jumping around and bleeding like everything too. And there's rat blood all over the street. And Ruth reaches out suddenly and grabs her son without even looking at it, clamps her hand over his mouth and holds him to her. Mama crosses to them rapidly and takes the boy from her. And Mama says, you hush up now, talking about all that terrible stuff. Um, and Benita says, you go outside and play, but, but not with any rats. 
And you think about the idea of the American dream, which is a major theme in this play, that the American dream includes things such as home ownership, college education, um, business ownership, and the idea of a backyard where, and a front yard, where one plays with puppies, not with rats. So you can see how dire the situation is for the family. On page 74, we get a speech about the meaning of money. And this, I think, is a, a great indicator of the capitalist idea of the American dream. When Mama asks Walter, again on page 74, how come you talk so much about money? And Walter says, with immense passion, because it's life, Mama. And Mama quietly, or oh, very quietly, oh, so now it's life. Money is life. Once upon a time, freedom used to be life. Now it's money. I guess the world really do change. And Walter says, no, it was always money, Mama. We just didn't know about it. And Mama says, no, something has changed. She looks at him. You something new, boy. In my time, we was worried about not being lynched and getting to the North, if we could, and how to stay alive and still have a pinch of dignity, too. Now here come you and Benita talking about things we ain't ever even thought about, hardly, me and your daddy. You ain't satisfied or proud of nothing we done. Um, and you my children, she says a little bit later, but how different we done become. On page 83, again, a very minor detail, but an important one. This is where um, George Murchison is speaking with um, Benita and also with Walter. And Walter says at one point to George Murchison that all these college students... Why are they wearing them faggoty looking white shoes? The idea of white, since black and white is so, so important in this play because it is about basically racism, primarily, although it also is about sexism and ageism as well. And the idea of um, Murchison completely assimilating into the white culture, into the Caucasian culture, which is one of the reasons why Benita does not want to be with him. She wants to be with a saw guy. Yet notice that Benita still dates George Murchison because she is enjoying the fact that she is able to um, live a life of, of a certain level of privilege with, with George. Um, again, there are positives and negatives to all of these characters, including Benita. Certainly, we admire her desire to get an education, but the idea that, again, she flits from hobby to hobby, very expensive hobbies, I might add, and does not have a job, meaning that the family is supporting her photography habit and her um, writing outfits. And keep in mind, she lives in Chicago, so horseback riding is absolutely absurd. Or guitar playing. Again, we can see a certain element of selfishness to her as well. And George Murchison on page 97 talks about the purpose of school from his perspective. It always makes me a little sad, too. And George is speaking with Benita, and he says, well, you know, the purpose of school is to read books, to learn facts, to get grades, to pass the course, to get a degree. That's all. It has nothing to do with thoughts. And I, I beg to differ. I think school has quite a bit to do with thinking and thoughts. Um, one of my favorite um, quotes happens to be when a saw guy tells Benita to sit around, or to sit for a while and think. I always tell my students that that's a superb piece of advice to sit around for a while and think. So on page 104 is where we're introduced to Mrs. Johnson. This is also a scene that usually is deleted. It was deleted in the Sydney Poitier version, usually because of length and also cost. Um, this is a long play. And again, we would have to hire an actor to play Mrs. Johnson with an understudy wardrobe and so forth. So this could be deleted and not sacrifice the integrity of the play. But I think that her role is particularly important because she illustrates the jealousy that that the youngers have to face from their own community. That rather than their community being um, excited and, 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 and supportive of the fact that the family is trying to improve their lot, oftentimes they're met with jealousy and resentment from their own people. And her name, Mrs. Wilhelmina Othello Johnson, uh, of course, a play on Shakespeare's 
Will's Shakespeare, so this is Wilhelmina. Uh, Shakespeare's Othello, though we get the female version of that, Othello, and Shakespeare's play Othello about a Moor, a dark-skinned man, who basically marries the Caucasian Desdemona, and all of the conflicts that result because of that, because of the racism and discrimination in their society. But one of the things that Benita says when Mrs. Johnson leaves finally is she says to her mother, Mama, if there are two things we as a people have got to overcome, this is on page 104, one is the Ku Klux Klan, the other is Mrs. Johnson. The idea that, yes, one would expect uh, the Ku Klux Klan to present barriers, but their own people will present barriers as well. So Walter, again, even though he has negatives, he also has positives, as do all of the characters. One of the things he talks about on page 108 are his dreams. And his dreams, as he says to his son, Travis, you wouldn't understand, but you know what? In seven years, you're going to be 17 years old, and things are going to be very different with us in, 17 year, in seven years, Travis. One day when you're, seven, when you're 17, I'll come home, home from my office downtown somewhere. And you wouldn't understand, son, but your daddy's going to make a transaction, a business transaction that's going to change our lives. That's how come one day when you're about 17 years old, I'll come home and I'll be pretty tired. You know what I mean? After a day of conferences and secretaries getting things wrong the way they do, because an executive's life is hell, man, hell. The more he talks, the farther away he gets. And I'll pull the car up on the driveway, just a plain Chrysler, I think, with white walls uh, or no, black tires, more elegant. Rich people don't have to be flashy. They'll have to get something a little sportier for Ruth. Uh, maybe a Cadillac convertible to do her shopping in. I'll come up the steps to the house and the gardener will be clipping away at the hedges. And he'll say, good evening, Mr. Younger. And I'll say, hello, Jefferson. How are you this evening? And I'll go inside and Ruth will come downstairs and meet me at the door. We'll kiss each other. She'll take my arm. We'll go up to your room and see you sitting on the floor with the catalogs of all the great schools in America around you. All the great schools in the world. And I'll say, all right, son, it's your 17th birthday. What is it that you've decided? Just tell me where you want to go to school and you'll go. Just tell me what it is you want to be and you'll be it. Whatever you want to be, you just name it, son. And I hand you the world. Again, another scene that oftentimes is not included in uh, productions of Raisin in the Sun because of length, but I think it, it illustrates that Certainly, Walter is very selfish, but he also wants what's best for his son and the next generation, which is part of the American dream that each generation does better than the previous generation. On page 118, when Mr. Lidner comes from the welcoming committee, there's a reference from Benita to him, 30 pieces and not a coin less. That's a biblical reference to the idea of Judas, who basically sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of coin. So basically saying that Lidner is also a kind of traitor. And perhaps the most important or one of the most important quotes in this play, in my opinion, is when after Lidner leaves and Benita and Mama and Ruth are talking about why it is that the community is so anxious about the family moving in. And the question that Benita asks, what they think we're going to do, eat them? This is on page 121. And Ruth response is, Ruth's response is, no, honey, marry him. That that ultimately is the ultimate fear, that there will be a mixing of the races and a dilution of the races. So as we continue on, we know about the plant, which I would argue is a character as much as any other character, right? Also on page 121. When Benita asks Mama, you're going to take that raggedy looking thing to the new house? And Mama says, this plant expresses me. And think about how that plant is very much a symbol for the family itself. Barely surviving, but continuing on because of Mama's love. Definitely in need of, of more space. Uh, it's in a too small of a pot. It needs more sunlight. Um, the idea that it's, it's something alive, much like the family is, but we don't know for how much longer. And it definitely needs a place to spread its roots, uh, much like the family does as well. So Benita talks a little bit about her dreams on page 132. And again, sometimes not included in productions, but I think this also is important to see that she's choosing to be a doctor, not just for the prestige and not just for the money. 
And she talks about on page 132, when I was very small, and she's speaking to a saga at this point, we used to take our sleds out in the winter time and only, and the only hills we had were the ice covered stone steps of some houses down the street. We used to fill them in with snow and make them smooth and slide down them all day. It's very dangerous, you know, far too steep. And sure enough, one day, a kid named Rufus came down too fast, hit the sidewalk. We saw his face split wide open right there in front of us. And I remember standing there looking at his bloody open face, thinking, well, that was the ending of Rufus. But the ambulance came, and they took him to the hospital, and they fixed the broken bones, and they sewed it all up. And the next time I saw Rufus, he had just a little line down the middle of his face. And I never got over that, that that was what one person could do for another, fix him up. Sew up the problem. Make him all right again. That was the most marvelous thing in the world. And I wanted to do that. I always thought that was the one concrete thing in the world that a human being could do. Fix up the sick and make them whole again. So in other words, she has altruistic reasons as well for wanting to be a doctor to help others. A side guy also talks about his dreams. And notice how important the idea of dreams happen to be in this play, which is why... The idea of what happens to a dream deferred is so important for our title and for our understanding of the play. Mama's dreams of having a garden and a house, a place where she can ultimately have safety with her family and focus on growth and renewal. Um, but Asagai talks about on page 135 some of his dreams. And he says to Benita, isn't there something wrong in a house, in a world where all dreams, good or bad, must depend on the death of a man? And Benita basically says to him, "You well, he says to her, you talk about what good a struggle is, what good is anything. Where are we all going and why are we bothering it? And why are we bothering? And Benita says, and you can't answer that. And he says, I live the answer. In my village at home, it's the exceptional man who can even read a newspaper or even sees a book at all. I'll go home. And much of what I will have to say will seem strange to the people in my village. But I will teach and work and things will happen slowly and swiftly. At times, it will seem that nothing changes at all. And then again, the sudden dramatic events which make history leap into the future. And then quiet again, retrogression even, guns, murder, revolution. And I even will have moments when I wonder if the quiet was not better than all the death and the hatred. But I will look about my village at the illiteracy and the disease and the ignorance, and I will not wonder long. And perhaps, perhaps I'll be a great man. I mean, perhaps I'll hold on to the substance of truth and find my way always with the right course. And perhaps for it, I will be butchered in my bed some night by the servants of empire. And beneath it says, ah, oh, the martyr. And Asaga responds, smiling, or perhaps I shall live to be a very old man, respected and esteemed in my new nation. And perhaps I shall hold office. And this is what I'm trying to tell you, Elio. Perhaps the things I believe now for my country will be wrong and outmoded. And I will not understand and do terrible things to have things my way or merely to keep my power. Don't you see that there will be young men and women, not British soldiers then, but my own black countrymen, to step out of the shadow some evening and slit my useless throat? Don't you see they've always been there and that they always will be? And that such a thing as my own death will be in advance? They who might kill me even might actually replenish all that I was. And what a sophisticated way of viewing things that, yes, his dreams include his people and that he understands that he himself might become corrupted. And if that were to indeed be the case, then it would be the responsibility of his countrymen to eliminate him so the progress of his nation could continue. Love, and I think I, I might have mentioned this in the previous video. I know I was having some mechanical difficulties, some technical difficulties, so I posted an older video, but I probably mentioned something about Mama speaking about Walter to Benita at the ending of the play, and Benita says there's nothing left to love, and this is her response after Walter's lost all the money, and Mama's response on page 145, there's always something left to love, and if you ain't learned that, you ain't learned nothing. Have you cried for that boy today? I don't mean for yourself and for the family because we lost the money. I mean for him, what he's been through and what it done to him. Child, when do you think is the time to love somebody the most? When they done good 
and made things easy for everybody? Well then, you ain't through learning because that ain't the time at all. It's when he's at his lowest and can't believe in himself because the world done whipped him so. When you start measuring somebody, measure him right, child, measure him right. Make sure you're done taking into account what hills and valleys he come through before he got to wherever he is. The idea that love is something that needs to be shown at one's lowest, not one's highest moment. And then, of course, Walter's wonderful transformation. And one of the questions that I oftentimes ask is, should Mama have entrusted Walter with the money? And certainly Walter is irresponsible and does what one could predict he would do. He loses it all. But if he hadn't been given the money, would he have had the opportunity to grow and change? In other words, the failure is what led to him finding his dignity. And when he's ready, or he thinks he's ready to accept Lidner's offer, this is his response. We come from a lot of pride. I mean, we're very proud people. And then my sister over there, she's going to be a doctor. And we're very proud. What I'm telling you is that we called you over here to tell you we're very proud and that this, Travis, come here. This is my son. And he makes the sixth generation of our family in this country. We've all thought about your offer. And we, just, we decided to move into our house because my father, my father, he earned it for us. Brick by brick. We don't want to make no trouble for nobody nor fight no causes. We'll try to be good neighbors. And that's all we've got to say about that. We don't want your money. And then finally, on page 151, we have the plant, which is something that Mama takes with her when they leave. Um, after saying that Walter's coming to his manhood today, kind of like a rainbow after the rain. And of course, the closing of the play, and these are the stage directions for me on page 151. Ruth hesitates then exits. Mama stands at last alone in the living room, her plan on the table before as the lights start to come down. She looks around at all the walls and ceilings and suddenly, despite herself, while the children call below, a great heaving thing rises in her. She puts her fist to her mouth to stifle it, takes a final desperate look, pulls her coat about her, puts her hat, pats her hat and goes out. The lights dim down. The door opens and she comes back in, grabs her plant and goes out for one last time. Of course, the importance of the plant because it symbolizes the family. So that gives us some closure on a raisin in the sun. And what I wanted to do was to transition briefly into poetry and that ultimately this will be our last unit. However, we have talked about poetry both in the short story unit when we were talking about a sorrowful woman and she was contemplating writing a sonnet. We talked about that that was a very structured form of poetry writing. In fact, we will revisit the sonnet very soon when we talk about Shakespeare's sonnets. And when we got to the drama section, we talked about how Oedipus the King was originally written in poetry and the difficulty in translation and keeping to some of the poetic structures. And then we talked about Shakespeare and how he oftentimes wrote in poetry and oftentimes to illustrate a particular station or status of a character. And then finally, A Raisin in the Sun that was based, or at least its title was based on a poem. So in those ways, we've talked about poetry. And you can see in the notes below that really is no clear definition of what poetry is. This reminds you of when we began the semester and we tried to define literature and there was no clear definition. Uh, poetry oftentimes utilizes things like rhyme, where the endings of words have similar sounds, or meter, in other words, it has a particular beat or rhythm or something like alliteration, which is where the beginnings of words have similar sounds rather than as in rhyme, where the endings of words have similar sounds. So it's oftentimes very musical. It's very dense and it's very compact. So you will see that um, 
we have more poems to read than we had with dramas, but the poems are going to require multiple rereadings. And while certainly I've encouraged that with short story and with drama, you must reread poetry. The shorter the poem, the more likely it is that you have to reread it because the shorter it is, the more likely it is that every element within it has a particular significance. So poetry oftentimes examines emotional states. So emotional states aren't oftentimes logical or clear cut. And I think you will see that with the poetry itself. Um, when we get to Dickinson, I'll talk a little bit about how perhaps she is one of the strongest poets that exists who is able to examine emotional states and all of the contradictions that exist within emotional states. Um, think about how flat a description is or a dictionary definition of something like happiness or sadness or jealousy. But yet those same things can be expressed in a poem um, that perhaps um, have much more significance than a dictionary definition. So a couple of suggestions for reading poetry. Read out loud so that you can listen for the sound. Again, it's musical. It's almost like listening to a song without the instruments in the background. Um, a song being read, for instance, the lyrics. But if you were to sing the song, and again, you were to add the musical instruments, then you would be able to hear the rhythm much more easily. But that doesn't mean that the language itself doesn't have rhythm within it. And one of the things that you also want to do is to annotate and read critically, which is what we've been talking about all semester long, that you want to be able to go through and take notes. And of course, when it comes to our journal, what I'm going to ask you to do is to select three poems from our poetry section and to devote about a page or so for each of those poems and to write a response about anything and everything that seems to be important about that poem. If it turns out that you happen to select for your journal, one of the poems that's an option for the final, well, certainly you could utilize your journal writings and my response to those. Um, that's not cheating. That's just really good preparation as I encourage students to um, annotate and to take notes and journals, not only because it is a component of a course, much like ours for writing a journal, but because it really is the best way to study because you can do it throughout the course of the semester. So what I wanted to talk about next class was a poem that is included in our textbook, uh, page 596 to 600. Um, it, it's about the poem Catch. Um, and um, on those pages, it talks a little bit about how to read that particular poem. That first you want to try to paraphrase it, put it in your own language, and then explicate, which is the word that we use for giving a very detailed analysis, uh, specifically usually of language, such as in poetry, where you're looking at everything, um, including punctuation and how that might be important, word by word. And that said, I was able to find the poem online as well, so that if you are not using the textbook, you can see in the seventh section, the notes below, I've got a link to that particular poem so that you can um, read that poem. Then we'll talk about suggestions for approaching poetry, and then we will get into the actual poetry itself, and I will be providing links for all of those poems, um, as well as the page numbers from where you can find them in our textbook. So that just leaves the attendance question for today, which would be due on our class discussion forum. That would be on Thursday, the 21st at 10 a.m. And the uh, discussion forum question is specifically related to the final exam and which date you would prefer that I post the final exam. So would you like to take the final on Thursday, May 12th at 1 o'clock? And again, you'd have 24 hours to complete that final exam. Or would you like to take the final on Tuesday, May 17th at 10.30 a.m.? And again, you'd have 24 hours to uh, respond to that. So just let me know which you'd like, and then that'll be the time that I will post the final examination. So I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. And next class, we will continue by talking about poetry. Take care. Bye-bye.